That's no problem. I think we should start. Yes? Okay, so um, let's um, start more or less on time. So on behalf of the uh, organizing committee, I want to welcome you all to the workshop of cosmology, South American workshop on cosmology in the LSST era. So it's really a pleasure to have you here. So the organizers are uh, Domenico Saponi, Jorge Norenia, Jeff Newman, Michael Strauss, Luis da Costa, and myself. And uh, uh, of course, not all of the organizers are here. <laughs> uh, so Domenico is here, Jeff, uh, Jorge is here, I'm here. And uh, I, I, the others, Jeff, Michael, and Luis, could not make it. I, I actually sent an email inviting them to participate in the opening via Skype. That's the answers I got. So this is from Luis da Costa. So thanks for the invite, but I'll be in a remote place on Monday with my kids. The remote place is Thailand. I shouldn't, <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but I know that. And Jeff actually said it's a bit early. It is early for him. And, uh, but he's going to give a talk by Skype on, in the last day, in the afternoon. And Michael Strauss is also a, says that 6.15 is a bit early for him. Hi, Chi Wei. <laughs> Uh, but he wishes for a productive meeting. So uh, all the uh, members of the organizing committee were very important to invite people, decide people that would come. So I really want to thank all members of the organizing committee for, for the uh, help in organizing this workshop. So now a few words about uh, where we are here physically. So what is this uh, ICTP Institute called ICTP South American Institute for Fundamental Research? And what is this other institute called IFT UNESP? So IFT stands for Instituto de Física. So this uh, South American Institute for Fundamental Research is started maybe six years ago, seven years ago, something like that. It's an in the uh, State University of São Paulo, UNESP, and uh, ICTP Trieste, and also FAPESP, that's the funding agency of the State of São Paulo, to set up a fund to uh, finance the programs of this uh, institute. So you are invited to visit the, uh, the web page of, uh, of the South American Institute, probably already done that. And we have many, many activities. So it's, it has been really successful. And, and uh, yeah, it's a non-stop. It's non-stop. <laughs> and this is the last activity of the year. And really, I couldn't make it any other day because all the other days were taken. So this is uh, impressive. So we have schools, we have workshops. So students that want to come are welcome. We have funds. And uh, so if you want to propose activities, that's, a, that's something we encourage people to do, propose activities um, for hosted here. So in fact, uh, there's a deadline for proposing activities for 2020. The deadline is December 31st. We still have time. <laughs> so please uh, propose activities. Uh, so, this, so this institute here is hosted by an, an older institute, this uh, Institute of Physica Teorica of the university. So this building belongs to the uh, university of, this, of the State University of Sao Paulo. And this Instituto de Physica Teorica is part of this uh, State University of Sao Paulo. And it exists since the 1950s, this institute. Not as a part of the university, but exists since the 1950s. So this is just a, a brief history of where, where we are now. Okay? Good. Now, what is the motivation for the workshop? So in South America, there are many scientists already that are working in international collaborations focused in cosmology, but not only in cosmology. And so we have members, we have members in the South American community that uh, belong to the EBOS, to Dark Energy Survey, DASI, JPAS, LSST, Euclid, and maybe I'm forgetting things that people participate. Uh, Astroparticle uh, collaborations like OJ, CTA, Alma, Llama, Bingo, etc. So the idea is to get this community together and see if we can uh, improve the uh, communication among us and also uh, the impact that our community can make in this, um, in this uh, international collaboration. So that's, that's very important for us. And the second motivation, I guess, one is also... 
because this laser is very weak, is to discuss the challenges for precision cosmology. So as you know, we entered the era of precision cosmology. Many challenges, and I hope we'll be provocative. I'm looking at Marco because I know he will be provocative. <laughs> and to discuss what do we need uh, theoretically and, uh, and observationally to uh, face some of the big challenges ahead of us uh, for precision cosmology. So, um, yes, if you, if you make a big claim like you know, CDM is wrong, claims need the really big uh, responsibilities, right? And, and, and to be sure that what you're saying. Okay, so this is, I hope this will be discussed in this workshop. And also my uh, intention, I think, of the organizers is that this workshop is kind of informal. So the talks, some of the talks are one hour, some are half an hour. So we have time to discuss. I hope we do get time to work, actually. So the format of the workshop is this. There, there are talks. There are At the end of the day, we plan some wrap-up sessions to you know, bring up the issues that were discussed during the day. Um, so we really hope to foment discussions and, and collaborations in this workshop. There was supposed to be an early career scientist uh, session. I sent out invitations for people to present, and they didn't get any. <laughs> so this session is not going to happen. So we just have more time for discussions. And uh, so we end at around 5 p.m. And the reason to end the workshop at 5 p.m. is because of the subway. <laughs> the subway gets crowded at around 5 p.m. However, there's a peak time, you know, 5 to 7, etc. And you guys are invited to stay over. You can stay later. Uh, to you know when the when the uh, uh, peak is over, like seven, seven something, and there are spaces here where you can meet and discuss. So in the first floor, for instance, there is a whole area that can be used to um, to meet and discuss. First floor of this building. So I can show you later if you're interested. So yes, yeah, so you're encouraged to stay and work. There can also be tutorials after the session. So that's something we thought of. I, and um, we contacted uh, Elizabeth Krause. She said she would be willing to give a tutorial on something called Core Cosmology Library. We contacted Davi Alonso. He said he would be willing to give tutorials on the master, etc. There are other people, I'm sure, they have uh, nice softwares that can be given tutorials. But I don't know if there is demand for this. So if there is demand for this, we can arrange things like that, mainly for the students, if there is demand. Okay. Now, in the infrastructure is the following. So we, we probably, uh, you probably were in touch with Jandira, the executive secretary of the institute, and Umberto, the secretary. So Umberto was out there. And if you have any questions, you can, again, just talk to them. Uh, internet, we have Eduram. And also, here in this uh, auditorium, we have a, 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 another network called Auditorio. And that, I think, is password. There's some lockers available outside if you want to leave your stuff and lock it. There, there are desks in the first floor, and, and the office 108 can also, there are many desks in the office, office 108 that can be used, again, if people want to discuss. There's also classrooms on the third floor. They're not being used because it's vacation time. So you can also use those classrooms if you want. There are t-shirts if you want to buy t-shirts like this one, <laughs> propaganda. Uh, we have uh, the official uh, picture taken uh, tomorrow after the first coffee break. And also, uh, if you want to have your talks uh, here, uh, you should send uh, your talks to uh, this Isabella, this, this, uh, this email. But you can also use your own computer if you want. Uh, we have connectors. Uh, maybe it's even better, because now I don't trust this computer much. <laughs> There's some problems with it. Anyway, so uh, you can use your own computer. And uh, um, yes, the, you, you can do that, or, or the pen drive. If you need a pen drive, you can just stick it in and uh, put your files here. So hopefully the f all the files will be made available. And we are also recording all the talks. So all the talks will be available on YouTube, I think. If you don't want your talks to be available, let, let us know, <laughs> and we will uh, not make it available. OK. So we are organizing a dinner Wednesday. Uh, I made a pre-reservation at the restaurant from Food from Bahia. It's a state in the northeast of Sao Paulo, if you're interested. I estimated the cost at around 150 reais. Not sure. Depends on how many caipirinhas you have. So it's around that. So uh, if you're interested, please sign up by the end of the day. There's a, a, a list here. I'll just leave on this uh, table. And that by the end of the day, because I have to confirm 
the restaurant. Okay, yes. So it's in Pinheiros. I give you instructions how to get there from the universe. Well, the un everything is easy from the universe, right? Uh, so from the universe, just take, take the subway and uh, you have to change once and you're there. Do you miss food from Bahia? <laughs> Oops, always. I did something wrong here, just a sec. Back to this. Right. So weather. So summer is here. Um, you're probably not used to have Christmas. Most of you are not used to have Christmas during the summer, so it can be funny for you. Um, so the typical weather during the summer is hot with thunderstorms towards the end of the day. And so please drink lots of water. Temperatures will be in the 30s uh, during the week. So drink lots of water. There are fountains near the elevator. Just, uh, yeah, just drink water, okay? <laughs> I, just want, I don't want anyone dehyd dehydrated here. Okay, good. So enjoy the workshop, and uh, we will, so Domenico will be the chair for the uh, next uh, session. And if you have any questions, just contact me or, or the uh, secretaries, okay? Very good. So Domenico, I pass this to you. Maybe, maybe you can use this. Uh... One, two, three. Yes. Is it on? Yeah? yeah. Okay. I think that it is, yes. Let me. Um... So, how does this work now? Um, what is it? All right, sounds good. Yeah. So it, it, it's until 9.20, I guess. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, so, okay, first of all, thanks so much for Rogerio, for nice introduction, and also for having this, for having hosting the, uh, the, the, the conference. So we start the, with the first uh, talk by Marco Simonovic, right? Yes. And he will talk about <coughs> modeling biased tracer and the field level. Okay. okay. So, um, well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for, for the organizers for the invitation. I, I did my PhD actually at ICTP in Italy, and I heard about this place. Uh, um, I heard about this place so much, and I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in South America, and I hope that I'll get a chance to um, come back again. So uh, what I want to talk uh, uh, about today is, is a recent paper um, that, that uh, uh, this, is the, this is the archive number, and it is done in collaboration with Valentin Assassi and Marcel Schmidtful, uh, Matthias Alderiaga, uh, all at, at the Institute for in Princeton. And um, uh, so I will not be provocative, despite, uh, despite Rogerio's uh, uh, explanations, but I, I think that um, this, this talk is somehow related to the second uh, topic that Rogerio mentioned, like what, what, what kind of precision do we need and what are potential problems with some sort of systematics that we can introduce by modeling things in an appropriate way. And um, uh, parts of the talk are going to be related to these, to these questions. Now, the, the, main, the main thing that we wanted to understand uh, when we start doing, doing this thing is, is a very old question about um, basically, which, which has several aspects. So a more theoretical aspect of, of the question is um, how well does perturbative bias model work? So you probably all know that the simplest way to model, way to model, way to model, model uh, the statistics of, of bias tracers is to simply use some bias expansion where um, you basically find a way to relate the fluctuations in the, in the tracer density field to the dark matter density fluctuations, and there is some nonlinear relation between the two, which involves some bias parameters and so on. So uh, one big question is always like, how well does this work? Like, um, at which scales, with which precision, 
uh, how, uh, how reliable this bus expansion is, can we get unbiased cosmology if you use bus expansion and so on. So that is one, one question. Um, but, um, uh, and, and then it's, of course, very much related. I mean, you can think about this question as a purely theoretical question, how well our understanding of how bias tracers form. But you can also ask, okay, now that, that we have some estimate, how well does it work? Then the question is, what kind of model should be used, for example, when we want to extract cosmological parameters from uh, galaxy surveys? And so that is another thing, what kind of model should be used? And uh, one very important aspect of this is that um, the, the bias tracer are not, the, uh, uh, or, or the fluctuations in, in the, in the uh, tracer field are not uh, given deterministically uh, just by the dark matter, but actually uh, they also have stochastic components, and this leads to some noise um, that you all know as a Poisson noise, and then uh, this noise, of course, usually is assumed to have the amplitude, which is close to a Poisson. It's usually assumed it's scale independent. But is this really all true? For example, are there some uh, dependence in this noise? And if yes, how big it is and how much trouble it can make? So these are all questions that go along the lines of what Rogerio was mentioning. And of course, the ultimate goal of all this is to get unbiased cosmological parameters out of whatever we do. All right, so of course these questions are super old. People were answering these questions for decades, and I'm sure that all of you have seen many papers where these things are being discussed. And um, in fact, here I'm just uh, like putting one single reference, which is a review about uh, galaxy bias um, written recently, and you can find many of the things that you, that, that you want to learn about bias there. But um, I, I, I would like to mention that Actually, most of these um, analysis in the past were relying on endpoint functions. So the usual strategy, for example, is to run an n-body simulation, use some uh, bias prescriptions, which relates dark matter and galaxies or halos, and then just ask, for example, if you measure the power spectrum or some cross spectrum like uh, matter, halo, power spectrum, and so on, then uh, how well can I fit this uh, this um, uh, results. Now the problem, th there are many problems with using endpoint functions. I mean, they're fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with using endpoint functions, but it's not maybe the most optimal way to test um, bias model. And the reasons are, for example, there is a, always a price of cosmic variance that you have to pay, uh, which means that uh, you always have to make some compromise on how big is your simulation box versus how high resolution you can make. Of course, the bigger the box, the smaller the cosmic variance. Aerobus, but then you cannot maybe um, resolve small halos. Um, you're pushed because of the cosmic variance to fit your models at higher k's, closer to the nonlinear scales, and then there it becomes difficult to disentangle uh, the effects of nonlinearities. This can lead to overfitting because, in principle, all these uh, power spectra and cross spectra are some smooth uh, functions of k, and you have, you have enough parameters to basically fit almost whatever you want. And um, in principle, only a few lowest endpoint functions are used, like the power spectrum or even bispectrum. But then if you do the bispectrum, you don't do the tri-spectrum. If you do the tri-spectrum, you're not using higher endpoint functions and so on. And in all these approaches, it's very difficult to really isolate the part which is a pure noise. I mean, how do you even define that? I mean, we do have some prescriptions. Say, look, let's, let's add one over n bar with some free parameter and feed that parameter. But what about scale dependence of the noise, for example? That is very difficult to get here. So, uh, so fortunately, there is, a, there is a relatively simple way to solve many of these problems. And this is uh, the following. So rather than measuring endpoint functions, the idea is to really try to, uh, to model the uh, the bias traces at the field level. So don't try to predict the correlation functions, but try to predict how the full density field looks like. Okay? In principle, uh, perturbation theory allows us to do that. And uh, this work and paper and this talk is going to be about that. How, uh, how does it work on the field level and how it works with embodied simulations? Now, when you do things at the field level, uh, first of all, if you use the same initial conditions to run embodied simulations, and to, for example, make perturbation theory predictions, then, because you're using the same seed, there is no cosmic variance. So you don't have to average over random realizations of the uh, initial Fourier modes, and that is very, um, very good, because it means that you can use even small boxes with high resolution to get very precise measurements. Um, you have 
put signal to noise at all scales. So you don't need to go to very high case uh, where nonlinearity non is becoming important. And basically, you can measure bias parameters even at, at your lowest k bin simply because there is no cosmic variance anymore. Um, also, uh, the problem with overfitting is not really there because if you want to do a comparison on the field level, you have to make sure that each Fourier mode is correct. So all amplitudes and phases of every single Fourier mode must be correct. And you're fitting basically two times number of Fourier modes, data points, rather than just like a much smaller number of points in the power spectrum or the bias spectrum. So uh, you really have the same number of parameters, but you have so many more data points that you have to fit. And this is why the things are much more constraining. And also, when you do things in the field level, you're automatically basically comparing all endpoint functions, because if the field is correct, all endpoint functions are going to be correct. The other way around is not true. And um, it turns out that in this approach, furthermore, it is easy to isolate and study what is, what is the noise doing, and I'm going to show some results about that. So this is the basic, uh, the basic idea. All right, so, so let me just again uh, say that um, what we are doing is we are basically generating uh, two, two realizations of, of, the, of the tracer field. One is generated using, uh, using the n-body simulations, and this we called delta halo truth. We think that this is the correct delta halo. And then we take the same initial conditions. We take the full uh, like, uh, slice in the initial conditions. We evolve these linear modes perturbatively. We do the bias prescription perturbatively. And then we ask, OK, the, the, the field that we find using the perturbation theory, how well does it correlate with the true field? Like, does it look the same, or it looks different, at which scale? And because we are using the same initial conditions, we are not paying the price of cosmic variance, meaning that if there, is, if there was an overdensity in the initial conditions in this part of the universe, there will be an overdensity also in simulation, it will be the same overdensity in perturbation theory. I mean, you don't have to, um, uh, to pay the price of the cosmic variance, which is very good. Okay, so... so um, so now the talk is going to have two parts. The first one is going to be a bit more technical. I would like to explain how do we do this perturbative calculation on the field level. This is not something which is very standard. Usually perturbation theory is used to predict correlation functions. And I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with some of these um, techniques. But on the field level, it's a bit more subtle. And I want to say a few words about that. And, but but if, you, if you don't want to, 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 to think too much about it, you can maybe just uh, turn off during this part of the talk. And uh, the, the whole point of it is just to show how to, how to basically make perturbative realization. And then the second part is really going to be about comparison with simulations. So if you trust me about making perturbative calculation, then you can just uh, focus on the second part and um, see how does it really work. All right. So uh, the first part is about uh, the perturbation tier in the field level. All right. So, um, so the setup here is that somebody gives you the initial slice with some density field, linear density field, and uh, asks you to basically predict how, how this uh, density field is going to evolve at some, at some later time. Now, um, for example, if you use the, the most standard approach, like Eulerian perturbation theory, you know that, that the nth order solution is basically some kind of convolution of perturbation theory kernels and these uh, initial Fourier modes, which means that um, if you use FFTs to go back and forth between real and momentum space, you can start with this initial uh, density field uh, and essentially calculate nth order uh, density field using simply perturbation theory kernels. You can do it numerically, and you can do it um, on the level of the field. Okay? Um, now, the problem with, with, with this, uh, so that would be the most naive answer that you may give. Like, let me just calculate and throw the perturbation theory and see what happens. The problem with this is that um, Eulerian perturbation theory is not doing well with capturing the effects of, of uh, large displacements or large bulk flows. Uh, which are which are uh, which are there, and uh, uh, and these effects are not very important for uh, the correlation functions. A lot of the correlation functions, all that they do is to spread the BO peak or 
damp the BO vehicles. Uh, but the broadband is, is, is always re remains untouched by, by these large bulk flows. However, on the level of realization, they're really important because if you have a clump of, of, of let's say, dark matter here, and uh, the, the, in, in reality, it is displaced by 10 megaparsecs, and your perturbation theory doesn't do it, then you're going to have a big decorrelation between uh, your perturbation theory field and the simulation. So these, these displacements have to be taken into account. Um, and so this, this sometimes goes under the name of IR summation. The, the, the name IR summation is there because there is, there is this infrared or, uh, or um, high, la, large wavelength or low K Fourier modes which are causing these bulk flows. But these bulk flows are very simple. There is some translation. And so then can be uh, exactly. And um, there are versions of Valerian perturbation theory on the level of the correlation functions which incorporate IR summation, but there are no versions of Valerian perturbation theory that do it on the field level. So this is one technical challenge that we had to face and to solve. Now, on the other hand, in Lagrangian perturbation theory, as, as also you may know, uh, these things are not really a problem because the displacement field uh, exactly takes into account all the bulk flows. However, Lagrangian perturbation theory only gives us the, the, the linear displacement. It's in Lagrangian space, while we would like something in Lagrangian space to co make a comparison with simulations. So, um, what we need actually is some sort of a hybrid scheme where we use the advantages of both approaches. And so, let me to fix some notation and maybe explain once again what is happening, say that, um, so for example, in simulation, you have some uniform distribution of particles in the Lagrangian space in the initial conditions. The fact that there are small density fluctuations is imposed by different velocities to these particles. And then they evolve in a nonlinear way and form, for example, like um, halos, let's say, in some uh, final conditions, and some final slice in Eulerian space. And uh, all these dark matter particles are being displaced. You can think of, of, of this thing as a mapping where you start from some uh, particle, in, which is a position Q in the initial conditions, and just to make a nonlinear displacement and move it to its final Eulerian position. And uh, there are essentially two components of this displacement. One is the simple linear displacement, or just Zeldovich displacement, which is actually the largest part. And this is this bulk, big, large bulk flows that I'm talking about. And then, of course, there are no linear corrections, which truly come from uh, non-trivial dynamics, and they basically tell you where each particle is supposed to end up. And so um, uh, what, what, what then we want to do, uh, essentially, is to, to, is to write down uh, the perturbation theory in the Eulerian space, but just using the fact that this uh, Psi 1 is large, and we don't want to Psi 1. We want to do perturbative expansion in delta, which is a true, truly small quantity, but we don't want to do perturbative expansion in Psi 1, which can be potentially large. And so the way to do that is simply to, um, uh, so, uh, is, is simply to start like uh, the, the, the bias expansion in Lagrangian space. So what is shown here is, the, for example, if, you, if you're in Lagrangian coordinates, then the simplest term that you can write down in the bias expansion is B1 times delta 1. This is just the linear bias. Uh, it just tells you that, for example, the uh, field of bias tracers in Lagrangian space is going to be proportional to the um, linear density field. But then, of course, there are also higher order terms. But there is a quadratic bias. There is this tidal bias and so on. And uh, once you're in Lagrangian space, then going to, going to Eulerian space simply means that uh, you have to do a change of coordinates that I showed in the previous slide. You have to displace particle from every position, or halo, from every position Q to the final Eulerian position X. And uh, this is done through the nonlinear displacement. And then the, finally, the, 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 the trick is to keep the, the linear part of the displacement, or the Zeldovich part of the displacement, exponentiated because it's a large quantity and expand everything else. So this is our model for how the bias tracer field is supposed to look like um, on, the, on the realization level. So this model is basically capturing two things. One is that there are some nonlinearities uh, induced by gravity, for example, like this one, and also by, by, um, uh, by the fact that we have nonlinear operators in the, in the bias expansion, and all of that is displaced by Psi 1. Uh, now, this is not something very, very new. Uh, I mean, it is new on the, on the field of these things, but in principle, this is a standard expansion in, like, uh, if, you ever, if you ever work with Lagrangian perturbation theory, people use this kind of split all the time. 
All right, so now, um, um, the, so, so this simple formula that I wrote on the previous slide motivates us to essentially write down the class expansion in Eulerian space in terms of these, so we call them shifted operators. So basically, uh, if, 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 if I go back, like every, everything here is the usual bias operator, like the delta, delta square, G2, and so on. Uh, but then uh, you, you start with these initial conditions and you apply this shift of, of, um, of the Lovich, okay? So, um, so in other words, um, we are trying to, to do, so what we're trying to do here is to say that whatever operator there is in the Lagrangian um, coordinates, just apply this psi 1 shift, and this is what defines uh, the shifted operator in Eulerian coordinates, okay? And so then perturbation theory prediction can be rewritten if you play a bit with these um, um, formulas. It can be rewritten in a way that resembles the usual bus expansion in Eulerian coordinates, except that all of these operators, uh, delta, delta square, g2, and so on, rather than being a simple Eulerian operators that we would naively write down, they're uh, very closely related uh, with the fact that they all involve this um, displacement, which is very important. So, um, so therefore, uh, in, in this way, we, we write down everything in, in Eulerian space, and so then it's easy to make a comparison with simulations. Um, uh, the IR summation or inclu inclusion of these large bulk flows is automatically taken into account, which means that we predict the correct position of the halos and the correct, spe correct spread of the BL peak and so on. And these operators are very easy to generate. For example, if you want to generate them in, sim in, in a simulation box, all that you have to do is to take the initial conditions. Like, uh, for example, the, the simplest operator, let me say this, is like when this, uh, th this quantity here is equal to 1. So this is just the shift of the uniform field, and this is the Zeldovich approximation. So now, if you want to do something more than Zeldovich, like if you put the linear field here, all that you have to do is to give some weights to the particles, which are still in the uniform grid, which comes from this modulation of the linear field, and then displace those particles. And they're going to generate the displaced linear field. If you want to do delta square, you make a square in the, of the field in the initial conditions and displace it again. So it's a very easy thing to generate on a computer. And also, what is nice about this is that uh, all power spectra of these things can be easily calculated analytically. So it's, um, um, it's nothing very complicated, okay? It's only slightly, more, 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 slightly different compared to the usual, the usual case. An important thing is that in this context, using the non to make any prediction. All right, so... Um, um, so, so let me... Maybe before I, I move on with 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 with, uh, with bias tracer, say that uh, now this might seem a bit mysterious because you may think, oh, this is very different from the usual perturbation theory. But actually, it's not because if you, for example, look at dark matter field, if you just ask yourself, how would I do the, for example, one loop power spectrum of dark matter density field uh, using this approach? Uh, there is a way to do it, and in fact, uh, the nonlinear dark matter to third order in perturbation theory can be written in this, in this way. Now, it doesn't matter what, what this thing, all these things are, but anyhow, there are some kind of um, uh, like uh, bias operators, uh, and you can express the dark matter field in this way. And, it, and the important thing is that if you calculate the power spectrum of this field, you're going to find exactly the same answer as doing the standard uh, perturbation theory with iris summation up to the two loop terms because of course these two prescriptions are designed uh, this order in perturbation theory to agree at one loop two loop can be two loop correction can be different and indeed uh, we find that this is the case so uh, what what is shown here on the right hand side for example is how the um, um, we're basically we're, we're focusing only on the on, 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 the, on, uh, on the difference is delta p over p non wiggle, and there are different combinations of delta p. So the important one is this thick um, purple line, which uh, basically is the, is the power spectrum of this field uh, minus the usual power spectrum of the Eulerian IRSM perturbation theory. And uh, as you can see, um, they have the same wiggles because the residuals are very smooth. So they have the same wiggles. 
It's only that the broadband is, is slightly different, and the difference is roughly of the size of the two loop terms. So that is something which is expected. So in other words, despite the fact that this may look like something very different compared to the usual perturbation theory, order by order in perturbation theory is the same thing. It's only something that, um, I mean, this complication with the displacement was necessary to make sure that on the level of the realization, things look correct. Okay, so coming back to the bias tracers, um, now we have some perturbative model to describe bias tracers. And if you ask yourself, oh, I want to do the perturbation theory up to one loop, I want to do the correct one loop prediction, usually we say that we have to include also the cubic operators because there are two contributions which are next to the leading order. One is like when you square the second order fields, and the other one is you combine the first and the third order fields. And um, these operators are th therefore necessary for consistency. Um, now, uh, on, the, on the field level, there is a way to uh, incorporate them in a very easy way without calculating them. And the trick is just to say that any of these operators can be split into a part which I'm basically just adding and subtracting this expression. So it, but, but now you see that it's, it's split into something which is parallel to delta 1, and this thing with construction is orthogonal to delta 1. So therefore, this piece here does not contribute to one loop level, and we can just neglect it. And so therefore, effectively, what we need for the one loop expansion from the cubic operators is just this piece. Now this piece, the only thing that it does is just to, to add some extra k dependence to b1, you see? If you combine this uh, field with this field, you're just having some k dependent b1 times delta linear. So this is a very simple way to take all higher derivative and higher order operators into, um, in, 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 or to include them into, into the calculation. So the motivation, so I'm showing this to motivate why it is a good idea to basically promote all these bias parameters to k-dependent functions. And uh, if you do this, you end up with something which is our final model, which is like, just use the lowest order bias, parameter, bias operators and multiply them with some k-dependent functions. Okay? Um, so now we are going to measure these k-dependent functions from simulations, of course, on large scales, all these k-dependent functions approach some constant, and hopefully they're not very scale-dependent. This is the hope from the perturbation theory point of view. And one last step, which is uh, technical and doesn't really matter, is that you can always choose a basis where these fields do not correlate with each other. You can, again, do this orthogonalization, and this is useful for practical purposes, because then each operator is independent, and it's much easier to fit uh, the simulations. What, 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 what I do next, so if I just choose now the fields such that, for example, this one is orthogonal to this one and this one and so on, they're all mutually orthogonal, then um, we, this only means that we are redefining these k-dependent functions in front of these fields, and I, I will call these, these final ones uh, labeled by b, beta 1 to n functions, okay? So when we do the comparison with simulations, we are essentially going to compare the model with simulations. So what does that, that really mean? So what it means is that um, we are asking the question, so now you see, uh, we started with some perturbation theory inspired model, and we made it a bit more general, because allowing free uh, functions of k is going a bit beyond perturbation theory. Uh, so in perturbation theory, we can make a prediction for what these functions of k should look like, and I'm showing the one loop prediction, for example. I mean, it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm just trying this to say that there is some formula and there is some k-dependence you can expect. Uh, but the point here is that what we're trying to do is to ask a, a very general question. The question is, like, um, if I take the simulation, the delta halo in simulation, the question is, like, how much of this delta halo field correlates with this particular model? Or in other words, how much of this delta halo field remembers the initial field coming in this simple combinations, and at which scales. So this is, this is the purpose of, 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 um, of this exercise. So, so, so it is a bit broader question, a bit more general question than just asking purely perturbation theory question, in which these functions are fixed. Uh, what we're going to do is to basically uh, try to, to, to um, uh, see how this more general model really works. But it's still important to say that and the question is still really like how much the halo density field remembers about dark matter density field. Um, and that, that is an important question here. Um, the, the important thing, of course, is that 
if, 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 um, if you stay within this perturbation theory answers, the number of free parameters is the same as in the usual loop calculation. As I said, we are going to do the comparison on the full field level, so we are fitting many more data points with the same number of parameters. All right, so if there are no any questions about this, so now let's, let's look at, at the results. This is probably more interesting part of, uh, of the talk. So what, what, what I showed in this first part is that there is some way to, um, starting with the initial density field, there is some machinery that you can easily implement which calculates how the final density field for bias tracers is supposed to look like uh, in, in, in the perturbative models. And then the question is, like, how does it compare with the simulations? Take a look at, at that. Um, yeah, I don't think I have enough time. So there, there are a few important questions when we when we ask about this comparison. So the first, the first question is like I, I, I told you that there are these three functions of k, these transfer functions of three parameters. Prediction for how these things look like in perturbation theory, of course, you don't know. So the first, sorry, does this work? Sometimes not. Sorry, uh, should I do something or? Uh, yeah, let's let's see. Um, so how do we choose these transfer functions or parameters? Okay, uh, so this choice um, uh, is basically done by uh, minimizing this difference uh, between the the truth uh, from simulations and whatever is our model. So remember, our model is some linear combination of different terms. All of these uh, terms are multiplied with a free uh, let's say parameter, and um, then uh, what we are trying to do is to is to ask the question: How much of the true halo density field can we explain uh, using this model? So we want to do to find the best possible fit to the full true halo density field, and this is what actually means to minimize this difference. So you see here, um, uh, the sum goes over all uh, wave vectors with, 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 within one bin of uh, magnitude k. And um, we're basically trying to minimize this difference. So we're looking at each Fourier mode uh, in, in, in the simulation, each Fourier mode in the perturbation theory prediction, taking the It's a battery or something. No, that's even worse. Well, I, I can use it if maybe there is a connection or something. Let me try to keep this outside. Um, so, um, yes, so, so, so we are trying to choose these parameters such that we get the best possible fit. So, so this, is, this is equivalent of um, really fitting, for example, bias parameters from the power spectrum. You calculate the power spectrum in perturbation theory, you measure the power spectrum in simulations, and you choose your bias parameters to get the best possible fit. Here we are doing the same thing, except that it is really on the field level, not on the level of the correlation functions. And so let me let me maybe explain uh, this in a very familiar and simple example. So uh, let's say that, that the true density field is given just by B1 times delta plus some noise, okay, some epsilon. So if you if you now plug this model here into this formula, you simply see that the, the op most optimal uh, bias parameter is going to be just the correlation of delta truth with delta divided by uh, the power spectrum of delta, okay? That's a very easy, easy thing to see. So, uh, so, so this quantity is re really your measurement of B1 of K. And for example, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you run an end-body simulation and you, you, you take uh, this as a simple model, this is really the way to measure B1 of K without, if you use the same initial conditions without any cosmic variance. So this is why this method is very nice, because then you can go on very large scales where this model is supposed to work fine, and you don't have to pay the price of cosmic variance. You get very nice error bars um, um, for free. And, and in, in more generally, like if you use more complicated model, uh, all our models are linear in bias parameters. So, uh, and all these operators that these bias parameters multiply are orthogonal to each other by construction. So therefore, each of these transfer functions is always going to be essentially the, the correlation of the true halo density field uh, with a particular operator divided by the uh, power spectrum of that operator. Okay? So this is what is going to be the result of, of, uh, um, of comparing with simulations. And see that, for example, if the 
field um, does not correlate with, with the operator, let's say delta square or G2 and so on, then this is going to go to zero, meaning like transfer function goes to zero and you cannot explain anything with your model. Uh, while if, if, um, if uh, this, this perfectly correlates with the true halo density field, then you basically get all the contribution uh, that, you, that you want from this operator. Okay? So this is the way to, uh, to see that um, uh, so, so that this check is really uh, making sure that, um, that uh, what, what, you're projecting the full halo density field on some basis, and you're measuring the coefficients of this basis. If they're zero, you basically don't explain anything. So this bring, brings me to the, to the question of, of uh, what is the success of this method? Okay? How do we more, more um, uh, quant uh, quantitatively measure uh, how well do we do? And so there are a few things that you can, you can calculate. For example, one option is to look at the cross-correlation coefficient between the, the model and the true halo density field, which is defined in this way. So you can define it for each Fourier mode, and here this average again means average over different directions for the fixed wave number, so it's a function of k. And again, if the cross-correlation coefficient is equal to 1, this means that your model perfectly correlates with the halo density field. If it is equal to 0, then it means that you're not explaining anything. It's completely different. Um, a, a related quantity is, is the error that you do, uh, which you can define as a field, which is basically the difference between the true halo density field and your model density field. And then what you can take a look at the power spectrum of this error, okay, or noise. So you see, the, the, the thing is that if you believe that our model perfectly describes uh, how halos really form, then the only difference compared to, the true, uh, to truth can be the stochastic part, which is not captured by uh, some function of dark matter field. And so uh, in, in the ideal world, this is a purely stochastic part. Of course, whenever you do a model, you're neglecting some higher order terms and in this definition, they still contribute to this noise. You cannot really disentangle the two. But nevertheless, you can estimate how big are these higher order terms. And you can see whether, uh, for example, if you find some scale dependence of this error, it can be explained using higher order terms or not. And so these are two quantities. Like one is like how, how well the two fields correlate with each other, which is measured by this cross-correlation coefficient. And the other thing is like, what is the power spectrum of the difference between the field and uh, the simulation, the field producing perturbation theory and the field producing simulation. And these two quantities for the best fit transfer functions are actually not independent, they're related to each other, and there are some simple formula that, that tell you how to go from one, one to the other. So obviously, um, uh, if, if, if transfer functions go to zero, meaning you're not explaining anything, then the cross-correlation coefficient also goes to zero, and this error blows up. So everything, everything is consistent, if all makes sense. All right, so, so what are some, some common expectations uh, when we talk? Uh, so now the, uh, I showed you the setup. I told you uh, how do we generate perturbation theory field. I told you how are we going to compare, what kind of statistics we're going to use to compare with simulations. And so what do we expect generically, OK? So some of the generic, uh, and these are maybe polemic points, if you want. Some of the generic expectations are that the noise is always close to Poisson noise. I mean, if I ask you, what would you put for a typical noise for any bias tracer, you will say, well, you know, on large scales, it must be close to 1 over n bar. And uh, this is what we do in the forecast. This is what we do, uh, I guess, even in the data analysis. We put some prior that, that the noise must be of this, of this, of this uh, amplitude. Also, the usual assumption is that the noise is scale independent. We just uh, say, OK, let's just add uh, like 1 over n bar. Or possibly, sometimes, we add some extra terms, which mimic the scale dependence of the noise. But we really don't know where they should really kick in, how big they are. Um, and so on. So that, that is something that, that usually we only guess and we cannot really tell with some reasonable prior. Now, the second thing that sometimes is, is being used is to say that uh, the linear bias model is good enough if you use the nonlinear density field from simulation. So, for example, you run your um, halo fit, it gives you the matter power spectrum. If you multiply with B1, this will going to reproduce pretty well. Uh, what the, the galaxy power spectrum, how, how the galaxy power spectrum looks like. This, of course, depends on the size of your error bars, how precise you want to be. Then again, depends on the volume of the survey and so on. But um, this is sometimes something that that 
is being used. And the question is like, is this really true? Uh, uh, um, how well does it work? And so on. And again, as I said, this is the questions are, are, are um, I mean, it is a bit difficult to answer these questions on the level of the correlation functions, but at least I think that everybody would agree that on very large scales, the linear bus model should be correct, okay? That if you go to uh, very low k, everything, everything will be fine. And another expectation um, that we all have is that uh, the perturbation theory should completely break down when we come close to the nonlinear scale. So what, what I showed in, the, in, the, in this previous slide is that we have some idea that the hell density field is supposed to trace what dark matter does, and maybe a tidal field, and delta square, and delta, and so on. But obviously, um, as these quantities are getting bigger and bigger and more and more important, uh, there are also higher order terms, and uh, then things become very complicated. So as we approach the nonlinear scale, the expectation is that the perturbation will be completely break down. And that means that um, we would expect that the cross correlation coefficient to really go to zero very quickly, the transfer functions to go to zero and noise to explode. Because we are imagining that once we close come to the nonlinear scale, uh, these simple templates will not correspond to the true hell density field. That is the usual expectation. So let's see how, uh, how these expectations uh, look like against the data. So before I show all the results, let me say that the, what is the numerical setup? You're using five boxes. Each one of them is 500 megaparsec. Uh, uh, length of 500 megaparsecs. We have uh, this number of particles, uh, which is pretty high number for this volume. Uh, this is our mass of the dark matter particle. And because of this high resolution, we are able to uh, identify also relatively, sm uh, relatively low mass halos. We study four different uh, mass beams um, uh, with four different, obviously, um, uh, number densities. And here, even though I'm not really an expert, I'm not quite sure what, uh, whether these numbers really correspond and in which context they correspond to all these surveys, but you see these numbers are something typical that, that we are working with. So they're, they're ranging from something which is like a very high number density and maybe optimistic number density to something which is very low and it has to do with like very, 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 very massive objects like clusters and so on. So, um, so uh, let's see how the things look like. So first of all, let me show you uh, one slice from the real space, just to give you some impression that, that everything seems to be fine. Uh, so what is shown in this first panel is the real, some particular realization, for example, for the smallest uh, mass uh, halos. Uh, it's a particular slice. So this is the scale. This is 20 megaparsecs. So, um, so this, is the, this is the halo density field in real space from simulation. Uh, this is the halo density field that we get if you use the same initial conditions and then run perturbation theory and uh, do the minimization procedures to measure transfer functions, as I explained. So these two fields look pretty similar. By eye, you can find some small differences. But you should also remember that this is a 2D slice, and if things are a bit displaced in the third dimension, they may look much more different than they really are. But anyhow, overall, I would say that the two fields look pretty, pretty, pretty similar. Okay, so. They're not that different on, on scales of, let's say, 10 megaparsecs, which is a typical thing that we really want to, to look at. Now, um, for example, if you, if you just use the dark matter field, nonlinear dark matter field from the same simulation, and you multiply with B1 to get the best possible uh, realization, then this is what you get. So the standard linear Eulerian bias uh, looks like that. And maybe you cannot really see it clearly, but it's more noisy. And also, the, the, you see the, the nonlinear dark matter field uh, exaggerates the over densities. So they're much bigger than they're really supposed to be. And also, it doesn't capture very well all this uh, structure that there is around. So already from real space, you can kind of see that there is some. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, oh, absolutely. No, no. It's, it's not a fair comparison because, yeah, this is using quadratic model, despite this cubic label. But I, uh, so, yeah, this is using quadratic models using the linear. So it's correct. You would have to uh, use the use the the 
the the same model, and it is true that even with the same model, it, it works worse. I'm I'm going to show this. Yes, yes, yes. It, it, it's not maybe much worse, but it is significantly worse. I'm going to show this more more um, uh, um, qualitatively, but this is just to give you give you an idea because usually when we do perturbation theory calculations, we never see the field. It's always some formula, 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 power spectrum, and so this is like. Um, I'm showing this to convince you that this is not some some blah 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 formula. I mean, it really can reproduce how the real field looks like, approximately, of course. All right. So um, so now let's look at, at some things in more in, in, these things in more detail. Okay, this plot is 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 very busy and there is not much to, to show here except that. Uh, so what this shows are all possible transfer functions for different uh, mass beams. And the main point here, you should look at these solid lines, the thick black solid lines, is that there is no much structure in these transfer functions. They're approximately, as you expect, constant on large scales. And then they do get some scale dependence, but nothing extreme happens. So when you cross the nonlinear scale, which may be like point a few, nothing really dramatic happens. They're kind of a smooth functions. And um, you can, if you want, feed them uh, with a few, uh, like either with the perturbation theory expressions or with a few simple polynomial-like terms and so on. So they don't have like a lot of structure. There is nothing terribly bad happening as you go from the perturbative regime to the nonlinear regime. Um, and now let's look at, 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 at the residuals uh, and, and, and the p-error. And I think this is maybe the most interesting plot that, that I want to show. So let's go through it um, in some details. Uh, so I still have 10 minutes, is that correct? Okay. So, um, all right. So, so what is shown here are four panels. They all correspond to different mass beams. So this is the smallest mass beam. This is the highest mass beam. Um, so what is shown in this purple line is the... Uh, standard linear Eulerian bias um, using the dark matter field from simulation. If you use only the linear bias but use perturbation theory, then you get this, um, this other curve. And if you use the full quadratic bias, things, things are these light orange curves. So now, what is shown here is like how this p-error, or like the difference between um, the true halo density field and uh, and the perturbation theory density field looks like if you use these different models. And you can see that the largest error, or the, or the, or the largest noise you get if you use the linear uh, um, Eulerian bias with the dark matter density field, you're doing a bit better if you use um, the linear bias with, in the perturbative models, and you get much better if you use quadratic bias in perturbative models. So, um, and this is the feature which Remain, I mean, th this story remains true on, on, uh, for all mass beings. So including these higher order corrections uh, in, in a way that I explain in perturbation theory really helps a lot to reduce the noise. Another important thing here, which is really maybe the most interesting one, is that um, the low k limit of this noise, if you use the wrong model, can be up to, I don't know, six times bigger than the Poisson value. So now that is something very dangerous because if you do a data analysis and you say, like, I have some parameter which is alpha over m bar, and you're using the wrong bias model, this alpha will be 6. So you're going to add, like, a huge noise to all your uh, data, uh, error bars and make uh, things look much worse, okay? So the reason why, um, and, and even worse than that, the, the, this noise is not really constant then, but it's strongly scale dependent. So using the correct bias model is really fundamental to avoid these two problems. One, that you are overestimating the size of your noise, and the second, that you have a scale-dependent noise. So only if you do the modeling properly, then you reduce the noise to the levels which are close to the Poisson, and the noise is roughly scale-independent. So, so this is to say that, that just the linear bias doesn't seem to be uh, really a good, uh, 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 um, a good solution for modeling the large scale, uh, like, like the, um, the halo density field, even on very large scales. Okay? So this, the usual idea is that higher order terms do not affect large scales, but this is not true because, um, for example, delta square can contribute uh, on arbitrarily large scales. Its power spectrum is flat on large scales, and this difference is precisely the effect of quadratic bias. Okay, so not including it is, 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 is a mistake. 
All right, so another thing that, that you, you, you see is something which is very well known, that, that for example, the noise uh, for very uh, massive objects is sub Poissonian, and this is because of exclusion effects and so on. But even then, uh, we can see that including higher order terms helps reducing it even further. So in all these examples, you can reduce the noise at least by a factor of two. And reducing the noise by a factor of two is like a lot uh, in terms of how much do you gain in terms of cosmological parameter information. All right, so uh, then if you look at other things, such as this cross-correlation coefficient, you find the similar things. So the cross-correlation coefficient becomes better if you use these um, biases which have uh, like uh, more terms and they go to higher orders. And um, there is not much here. It's a similar story to before, including quadratic bias seems to help a lot. And um, indeed, the cross-correlation coefficient um, goes to uh, zero eventually, but this is mainly because it follows the expectation from the Poisson noise, and uh, of course, when the Poisson noise becomes as big as your uh, halo power spectrum, you cannot expect to gain anything anymore, because simply you're entering um, the, the, the regime where, you, where your noise is very large, and this happens at, at very high k, so um, this is something that we expect. Uh, and so finally, um, one very point here is that I, th I told you, like, oh, look, the noise becomes much less scale dependent. And that is true when you look at in these big plots where we're not zooming in. But if you look at it more carefully, um, then we see that actually there is some scale, residual scale dependence in the noise, which is there. Um, and these blue bands are 1% bands. So what is shown here is the difference of the noise compared to a constant, the best fitted constant from the low K part. Uh, compared to the true power spectrum of halos, okay? So, um, so basically, if, if, if you go outside this band, you're making 1% error on the halo power spectrum. Uh, and that, for, for, for like particularly for future uh, kind of um, galaxy surveys, is, is, is a big, big thing, because it is of the same size, effectively, as, as neutrino mass. So, uh, but anyhow, what this shows is that the, the noise is... Uh, almost like you can, you, like you're doing better than 1% in terms of scale dependence, up to the scales now, depending on, on the mass bin, up to the scales which are of order point uh, few. So for maybe the most interesting are those two, which have like uh, some sort of realistic um, number densities for future surveys, and there you can see that you can go to K of point uh, 0.3 or point 0.4 and so on, without introducing significant, or let's say more than 1%, um, error in, your, in modeling of the power spectrum. Now, it's very important that this error doesn't, doesn't go away with, with um, increasing the volume of the survey. So you, usually you beat the noise increasing the volume of the survey, meaning that your error bars are shrinking. But the fact that you're doing a systematic error of 1% always remains the same. So this is something that is really dangerous and it can spoil the cosmological parameters. Yes. Yes. But why are you not comparing the second order? Okay, let me do it. Let me do it in the next. Uh, I think it's the next slide. Yes. Okay. So now, how does it look like if you do? Um, so, so here, um, yeah. I guess that I'm almost running out of time. But uh, um, so what is shown here is that so this purple line, the, 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 this darker purple line, is the linear Eulerian bias. The, the other purple line is the quadratic model. It's the same model as you do with the perturbation theory, but apply to the nonlinear density field from simulation. And you can see that it does better, of course, but it, uh, it is still not quite there. I mean, there is still like a factor of two or three uh, in, in, the, in the noise, which is a lot. I mean, it's a big, a big thing if you think about how much money it goes to reduce the noise. I mean, so. Um, so, so I think the conclusion is that, that Eulerian biasing, at least in this context, just using maybe um, uh, dark matter field from simulation, never really works. It doesn't really give you the most optimal uh, density field. Uh, and the reason for that is that, uh, as, as, as I showed in the first slide when I was showing the real space, the reason is that Eulerian perturbation theory exaggerates um, over densities. Uh, and it, it, it basically then, what, 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 which means that, that it downweights the, the, the importance of these higher order biases. It can never quite get there as, as the standard perturbation theory. And so you might then think, well, let me then smooth the, the 
density field. Let me throw away very small scales, which produce a large delta square and so on. But if you do that, it's true. You're not having that problem anymore of polluting uh, your large modes with some uh, random noise, which comes from small scales. But then also you're losing a bit of uh, information on the small scales. And again, you're not fitting it quite well. And so what is shown on the right-hand side is, again, the full quadratic um, model of the, um, of the Eulerian biasing using perturbation, using matter from simulations with different filters. And again, it, it really never goes below this curve. So um, you can never quite reach the levels of the noise and the scale independence as, as using the, 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 other, the, other, the other way. OK, I'm running out of time. Let me skip this slide. I can just say that in one sentence that mass weighting really helps. It's something to think about. Uh, it really reduces the noise quite a bit uh, if you have a reliable way to estimate what is the mass of the, of the hell. And so these are my conclusions. So I think that um, th this way of doing things, of comparing uh, things at the field level, is very useful because you don't have to pay the price of the cosmic variance. You're measuring all endpoint functions at the same time. It's the most honest way to compare models. You, there is no overfitting and so on. Uh, it seems that there is almost uh, that, that, that no bias model based on dark matter fields from simulation um, leads to the optimal density field because the nonlinearity is exaggerated. Uh, the halos really do not wait until the final nonlinear field is formed, and then they get biased. It's actually the other way around. Um, the good news is that um, the simple quadratic bias model works well, and that it leads to a noise which is close to Poisson and roughly uh, scale independent. And uh, one th thing that is still uh, somewhat worrisome is that there is a residual scale dependence of the noise, of course. Uh, if you want to go to a percent level, then uh, you have to start to worry about the nonlinear scale. Um, of course, there are like uh, uh, questions: how how well does this all work for galaxies in Redshift space and so on? Is something that we are going to uh, to do in the future. Uh, and, and interesting questions are: can this be applied to the reconstruction of the initial conditions? And uh, for example, is it useful for um, calculating the likelihood on the field level, uh, doing the forward modeling and so on. So all these are some open, open questions that we didn't talk about, but um, I'm happy to discuss with anyone who is interested. OK, stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marco. Do you have any questions? Just about the. Sorry. Okay. Uh, just about the displacement in the perturbation theory. Uh, do you take in account shell crossing, or? Um, well, there is no really. I mean, like it is the same. Like when you do when you do Zeldovich approximation, you can start with some homogeneous. Let's say let's do the Zeldovich. You start with the homogeneous density field with particles. You calculate psi one and you just displace them. Whether they shall cross or not, you don't really care about that. Yes. So it is the same thing here. It's only that you're not moving the uniform field anymore, but you're moving um, delta or delta square and so on. So, but it's the same algorithm. Okay, you have shown uh, you have shown the comparison for simulation with only one redshift. Yes. Um, uh, for a real application, uh, yes. can you comment? For example, it would yes. be interesting to see this in a range of right. redshift. Right, I, I right? completely agree. So it is true we did it only for one redshift. Um, I, I think that that it is pretty clear that the story will be the same at at other redshifts. What can happen, of course, generically, as you go to higher redshifts the importance of these quadratic terms will decrease. So I expect that there, uh, there, will be, uh, there, will be, there will be less importance. But these generic features, that the noise is still going to be, uh, like the, the B2 really is producing a part of the noise, that, that yeah, because the real noise and so on. Right, right. Yeah. because if you have this comparison of the, the P uh, rate with the simulations in a range of redshift, maybe, because you know that's what is very difficult to to quantify in the simulations is, is the the uh, the whole of the gravitational instabilities around the the simulation. So maybe uh, 
in a range of z, it will be possible using this approach. Yes, I, I, I expect that um, I expect that everything will be almost identical as you move, unless you go to very high registers, of course. But everything below two or so, it will be more or less the same story. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Is this working? Okay. Uh, so I have a possibly a naive question, which is, <clears throat> when you modeled your transfer functions, yes, were they more sensitive to halo properties like mass or to co changes in cosmological parameters? Um, that, 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 that I think I, I think that the answer is probably they're sensitive to. Um, well, let me. I think maybe say this. So the transfer functions have two, uh, like two parts. They have three bias parameters, which I think are for sure more sensitive to the change of the, uh, the change of the tracers. And then there are parts which are k-dependent functions, which depend on the power spectrum. And I think that these are more sensitive to the cosmological part. Okay. So I think.